Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Thank you for coming out on a Monday night. I know you could be home watching the 49ers lose, but they did that yesterday. So um, thank you for coming this evening. It is always a blessing to come here to Lighthouse Baptist Church. As Pastor said, I, I, I keep a, a record of where I preached and when I preached someplace and going through messages and praying about some things. I, I, I went through some messages. I thought, well, no, I preached that one there. No, I, I've preached that one there. And no, I preached that one there. And after... 20, I think 20, at least 20 years, Pastor and I have been friends of 20 years of having me preach um, at this church, and I appreciate that very much, and I appreciate this church. I especially appreciate your pastor and his dear wife. You know, if you think about it, the average pastor stays in his church uh, three to four years now. So having been here in this church for 26 years, correct, uh, that's quite amazing. And thank you for supporting your pastor, for praying for him, loving him, being faithful. There's, uh, <clears throat> anytime a man does something great, there's always a great woman behind him. <laughs> and a surprise set of in-laws. That's another thing. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Thank the Lord for that and thank you for coming. Would you stand with me tonight if you are able to Ephesians 6 and verse 10. And I will also do the same tonight, Pastor, talk about being brief. I will be brief no matter how long it takes me. So we'll get there. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Please, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore... Take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, <clears throat> and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and notice in your Bibles at the end of verse 17, a semicolon there, punctuation continues because the armor has not, the description for the armor has not ended yet. Verse 18, this is also part of the armor of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And I'll stop there though the thought with Paul continues here. There are eight pieces in the Christian armor, eight what I want to talk to you tonight about is not only to describe for you this armor, but to describe you the most important ingredient in the armor of God. Let us pray. Father, bless now, Holy Spirit, help tonight. These dear people have had their long day today, their work, their home, their lives. But they put in their day a time to come and listen to the word of God tonight. I know they are, they are blessed to have a faithful man of God stand in this pulpit week in and week out and teach and preach them the word of God. So tonight, Father, I'll need a special enablement of you for me to help be a blessing, encouragement to this good church. Please tonight, Father, may it be that we learn something tonight, nothing new, I would hope, but something that will help us in our lives on our day-to-day -day walk on this planet, on this earth. And yes, Father, in this world, but not of it. Bless tonight, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. In the Bible, five times the armor of the child of God. Five times the armor of the child of God is mentioned. In Luke chapter 11, verse 32, it says, Be careful lest the thief steal your armor. In Romans 13 and 12, it talks about putting on the armor of light. In 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 7, it talks about the armor of righteousness. In Ephesians 6 here, verse 11 down to verse 18, speaks of the armor of God. And that's where we're going to be tonight in Ephesians now, the armor of God, as you'll notice, is there are eight pieces that are mentioned. We'll come back to describe each one briefly in just a moment. Five of the pieces of the armor of the Christian are defensive pieces of armor. Three of them are offensive pieces of armor. And we must know and understand the armor of God is essential for us, as it says in the Bible, for us to be able to stand in the evil day. You do realize, Christian, we live in a spiritual warfare. It's amazing how many Christians I know who think, well, I've heard of that, but in reality, no, I'll tell you how you know we're in a spiritual warfare. There's casualties. And there's victories. But every day of our lives, we step onto the battlefield of spiritual warfare. 
And in the Bible, it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, it talks about being a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Well, then if that's not warfare, I don't know what is. And it goes on to the scripture to describe in militaristic type forms the Christian life in a militaristic type way. Because, friend, we are in a spiritual warfare. You know, and by the way, it's not like you get to decide, well, I'll, 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 I'll join this part. You don't. The moment you draw a breath, you swing your leg over the edge of the bed, you stand up and you step out. Even in your own house, you step outside, you're on the battlefield. And it is essential for us that we need to know this business about the armor of God. Now, without describing each one in great detail, there are eight pieces. But what's important to notice about them is this. Each of those pieces of the armor of God is in direct relation to your relationship with the Bible. We're having our loins girt about with the truth in verse number 14. That's knowing the word of God and having the word of God. Loins so you're ready to take it. Uh, talking about the breastplate of righteousness. That's when you take the Bible and you put it into practice in your life. Then there's the uh, preparation of the gospel of peace. That's witnessing and soul winning. Using the word of God to lead folks to Christ. In verse 16 talks about having the shield of faith. Faith is not just believing something. Faith is believing the Bible and acting upon the Bible. Your protection of shield against the fiery darts of the wicked is believing the word of God, acting upon the word of God. Then in verse 17 is the helmet of salvation. That's the assurance of salvation on the head. So you have a no-so kind of salvation. Not a think-so, not a hope-so, but a no-so kind of salvation. Then in verse 17 again is the sword of the Spirit. Now that's using the Bible as a weapon in your life. Not to beat people over the head with it, but to use it in this spiritual. We're not supposed to just take it from the devil. We're supposed to give it to him too. And when you use the word of God, it's the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And then in verse 18 is praying and supplicating. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if we realize that prayer is such a powerful weapon. Most people have the attitude of, well, I pray about it, but what else should I do? Excuse me. What else should you do? You mean prayer is just kind of like the pastor got with his deacons after service on a Sunday. He said, gentlemen, we're, we're in some serious financial trouble and we need to pray. And one of the deacons said, oh, pastor, has it come to that? <laughs> I have people come in the office, you know, pastor, I, I need some help with something. I, I know I need to pray about it, but what else? And I think, well, have you really prayed about it? Yeah. Lee Robertson Many years pastor the Highland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee, when people would come to him and say, I, I, need, uh, I need counseling, he'd ask them this, have you been reading your Bible and praying? And if they said no, he said, you go back and do that for two weeks and then come see me. More than 80% of people never came back. Your relationship to the word of God, that's what the armor of God is. Not having a Bible, having these pieces of the armor, their effectiveness working in my life gives me the protection that I need. Now, the subject tonight is from verse 11 of Ephesians 6 and verse 13. And the subject is this. Put on the whole armor of God. In verse 13, take unto you the whole armor armor of God. Now, I'm not sure if I understand it correctly. I had two years of Greek and a year of Hebrew in Bible college and have been successfully delivered from all of it. <laughs> if, I, if I get it right, here's what I think that means. You need it all. Yeah. We don't place smorgasbord. Oh, and I went and talked about food. I'm sorry, Pastor. <laughs> smorgasbord. I can see you at a smorgasbord now, going by the salad bar and picking up a leaf or lettuce and food eats that stuff. You know that, right? That Food eats salad. <laughs> so I'll stay off the smorgasbord. Anyway, you can't play smorgasbord with the Bible. Well, I like this part. I'll take this piece of armor up. No, listen, Christian. For it to be effective, you have to have every piece of this. So that's why anytime God repeats something, he repeats it for emphasis. So when he said twice in a few verses, take unto you the whole armor of God. That you may be able to stand, having done all to stand. Notice it also that taking whole armor is related to my strength, my spiritual strength. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. That armor holds you up. It, it gives you strength. It gives you connection. It helps you to hold you together in your life. So I have strength from the armor of God. Then it tells me here that, 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 that the armor of God gives me protection. And it also gives me weapons with which to fight. We've kind of gotten a, a victim mentality in our Christian life today. Everybody's a victim. 
Well, you know, my life and myself, and I know that, and that things happen to us, and I don't, I don't belittle that whatsoever, but I do believe this. I believe we're supposed to be victorious Christians. Now, the armor of God is going to make the difference between being a victim and being a victor. Because if you don't have the armor, you can't stand in the evil day. You're going to run into the battlefield without the equipment necessary to protect yourself and not only protect yourself, but be able to defend what you need to defend and to go on the offensive in this world today. We need to be, hey, we need to be pushing back the darkness. The darkness doesn't be overtaking us. We're supposed to be salt and prevent the corruption in this world. We're not supposed to let the corruption overtake us. We're supposed to dispel the darkness with our light that we live. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And there's times, in one, as we mentioned at the beginning here, there, there's a, a reference to the armor of, God, uh, armor of God called the armor of light. Take unto you the whole armor of God. So let's take that admonition about the whole armor tonight and consider these. If I have to, look here, if I have to take unto me the whole armor of God, that means number one, having the armor of God is not automatic. Well, I'm a Christian, I have the armor of God. No, you don't. You're a Christian, you have salvation. But every, listen to me, you must take unto you the whole armor of God. That means if I'm a saved person, I have the access to the armor, but it's not mine automatically. It just comes as I'm a born-again Christian. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, that book is absolutely useless and powerless until it is applied and taken into my heart and into my life. So much of it, so much of Christianity today is about, talks about what people, you know, they have a Bible. They, they have, they know the Lord. I have this. I have that in my Christian life. Wonderful. How about this? What do you do with your Christian walk? What do you do with your Bible? Has this, is this book an armor of righteousness to you? Is it, do you go to the Word of God for the assurance of your salvation? Do you use the sword of the spirit when, when that which is wrong comes to your life? Do you take the word of God like a weapon and say, no, this is what the Bible tells me to do. But the key is you, you don't just have the armor of God, you have to take it. So it's not automatic. Number two, having the armor of God is a unit. You take the whole armor of God. All eight pieces are mentioned and said I need to have them all. Not so I can choose which one I want, but I need to understand to be protected effectively. I have to have all of it. Well, Pastor, you know, I love the Lord. I read my Bible and I, I go to church. Good, good. Do you witness? Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Do you, when you go to a soul winning church, do you go soul winning? Do we make that a part of our life? Say, well, that's not really my gift. That's not a gift. It's a command. And if we don't have that, now listen to me. If we leave one piece of the armor out, Satan is wise enough to know how to find that piece that's missing in our lives. That's why it's take unto you the whole armor of God. Now listen, listen, dear people. You're in church on a Monday night, so I'm not here to, to scathe you about what, what you do or shouldn't do with your life. But going to a Bible preaching church doesn't mean you're a Bible living Christian either. As you, the blessing of going to this church, and by the way, don't ever weigh that against people who don't go to a church like this. Well, I have free Christian friends. They go to different kinds of churches. They never talk about that kind of stuff. I can't answer for their pastor. He shouldn't have to answer for their pastor either. You should know this. That man loves you enough to preach everything that's in this Bible. Amen. Why? Because he wants you to have every piece of protection in your life that you need. And you need the whole armor of God. And if you don't have it, Satan will find it. That's why the Bible said, he is as a roaring lion who, what? Walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Have you, have you seen lions, have you seen a lion run and jump on the back of a full, full grown bull elephant? Doesn't happen very often. Have you ever watched a, have you ever watched one of these uh, uh, um, uh, hyenas run up jump on the back of a hippo? Well no, they wait and pick off something that's weak and wandering, something that's susceptible. You see what happens when we were in uh, Africa a few years back uh, some of the guys from I took some of the guys from our church and we were in Kenya out in the Maasai Mara and driving out into the bush and um, it was a, it was a wildlife refuge. Now, don't think fenced in anything. It was 
he would pull up to this little rock thing that looked like a gate and he had a stick that went in front of it. You gave him a few bucks and you drove in there. And then there was herds of everything in there, elephants and zebras and giraffes and all kinds of critters standing around. It was beautiful, but really interesting. And we're driving along. Matt Williams was with us and, and, and uh, my father-in-law and some of the guys. And we're driving out. As we pull up to that little gate, the guy told us, he said, he said, are, there li- I said are there any lions out today? And he said, oh, yeah, Simba, Simba, over by the river over here, the Maasai River. And so he tells us where the lions are. So we're driving along and we're seeing all these animals just standing around. Some of them, a herd of water, Cape Buffalo, ran across the road right in front of us. I could have reached out and slapped one of them. And, and, and they're big, muscular animals. And their hindquarters, almost all of them had hindquarters with claw marks on them where the lions had tried to take them. And so we're driving along. We see the river over there. We drive over toward the river. And the grass out there is real tall, about 8, 10 feet high. This golden grass that's there. And then there's this little path about the width of this step here that wanders over to the river. Well, we couldn't get to the river. We got to maybe 100 yards or so, 150 yards from it. And we're looking out into the river from the van we're sitting in. And we see these big boulders out in the river. And all of a sudden, the boulders start moving up the river. And then pops his head up. And it was a hippo. And their crocs are jumping in the river and stuff. And the guys pull up and one of them swings the door open. And he goes, man, I'm going to go take that picture. I go, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. Isn't this where they said the lions were? And they go, yeah, Pastor. And I go, huh? There's a path about not even that wide through that tall grass, 8, 10 feet high, out to that river, 150 yards away. I said, if there's a lion out there and you're running through that grass... And you come around the corner, ah, and there he is standing there. He, he'll eat you. Oh, now, Pastor, come on. I said, this looks like a zoo to you. You see anybody selling popcorn and cotton candy? I mean, this ain't a zoo, Jack. This is Africa. We're in Africa. Do you see all them animals over there? They eat those animals. They will eat you. Do not go running out of this van. Oh, Pastor, come on. Goes, okay, okay, just leave the keys here. Because if you get eaten, I don't want to have to dig through some lion's stomach to get the keys out so I can go home and tell your wife you're an idiot and you ran out in the bush and got eaten by a lion. The truth is, people, we, we live on this spiritual battlefield with a lion who walks about and he's looking for an opening. Yes, sir. We can't just take some of the armor. You say, I'm a Bible-believing Christian. Now, this is going to sound strange, but stay with me. That ain't good enough. You need to be a Bible-living Christian. And you need to look at these pieces of armor and say, do I have this in my life? Look, when I, when, I, when I step away from the Word of God and I do something with my life that's contrary to the Bible, you just took a piece of armor away. And Satan will do his best to find that place. That's why we're seeing so many casualties in the Christian life. We got Christians, look at me, we got Christians who want the Christian life and protection of God on their terms instead of God's. He said, take the whole armor of God. I was stationed in the service in, in Greenland. I was in, the, uh, I was in the Air Force. You were in the military, weren't you, Pastor? I was in the Air Force because my IQ was too high to be in another branch of the service. So that was the only one that would take. You were in the Navy, is that right? That's too bad. And uh, how many have been in the military? You were in the military. What branch are you in, brother? Navy. Navy, sir? Marine Corps. Marine, Semper Fi. <laughs> sir? Army. In the Army. Good. Anybody else I can assault before I'm done tonight real quick? All by myself, the Air Force guy, okay. <laughs> the fighting branch, of the, I can't even get away with that. All right, never mind. I, just, I know, I understand. I had a guy say one time, he said, you know, the Marines are a division of the, of the Navy. And I heard a Marine say, yeah, the men's division. Okay, anyway, but. <laughs> so I was in the Air Force Station up in Greenland. There was nothing to do up there. It was a remote tour. There was like 200 of us on a base out in the middle of nowhere in Greenland. Ninety-some percent of the country of Greenland is covered by an ice cap. So one of the days we decided to take a hike out there on a nice day, which you didn't get a lot of those in Greenland. And we hiked out to this ice cap. Well, when the weather's nice, the sun is out, the mosquitoes are just atrocious, and they are vicious. I mean, you have to spray, you have to spray in your face, your ears, your hair, your clothes, because if you walk out there, they'll just start pounding away on you unless you're completely covered in this insect repellent. So we had backpacks on. It was about a 12-mile hike out to the ice cap. And uh, we're hiking along out there. It was kind of a warm day for Greenland. It was a warm day, sunny day. And a guy walking in front of me began to perspire. And a, and a line of sweat went down his neck like this, as I could see it. And as soon as it thinned out that insect repellent, there was a line of mosquitoes all the way down that. They found it immediately, so we had to stop, spray up, and everybody had to keep an eye on them. Oh, man, you got them all over the back of your head, you know. 
and we'd have to spray each other down. Listen, the devil's worse than them stinking mosquitoes. He is looking for an opening, a spot. We have It's a unit, the armor of God. We have to stop playing pick and choose with the Bible, especially with what the Bible describes as the armor. You say, well, those eight pieces, that covers everything in the Christian life. Yes. Yes, don't you see? That kind of Christianity that just expects little, asks little, and gets nothing. Those people are getting gobbled up by the devil today because they have no protection. The armor of God, it's a unit. Number three, having the whole armor of God means the armor of God is not complete. If you look at those eight pieces, guess what? There's no armor for the back. Breastplate of righteousness. Shield of faith, helmet of salvation, feet shod, loins girt about with the truth. There is no armor for the back. That means this. If you back up on God, back out, backslide, and walk away from what you're supposed to be, you have no protection. When we were, uh, we had a young man in our church who had been, had a couple of tours in Iraq, and when he came back, he was in the Marine Corps, when he came back, he was talking about some of his training. And he was saying when they trained us about what to do when you got caught in a firefight, you're ambushed. They trained you to go to the enemy. If you retreat, you'll be killed. You get down, you crawl, but you go toward the enemy. You do not back out. And I thought to myself, man, is that the Christian life or what? It, it, there's only D in God's transmission. That's drive for some of you. That's D, okay? Go forward D. Unless you drive a Tesla. I don't know what you do with that thing. Anybody have a Tesla? I drove one the other day for the first time. I was in Southern California preaching. This, <laughs> this guy spent $80,000 on this thing. Then another $20,000 on the equipment. There's a $100,000 Tesla. And this crazy man let me drive in L.A. rush hour traffic. A <laughs> $100,000 car you still had to plug in the wall at night. I mean, think about that for just a moment. <laughs> I'm old school, bro. I just put the gas in it, mash on it, and we're out of here. You know, the truth of the matter is, dear people, we get somehow we get the idea that we just back up, we'll be fine. No, there's only D in the transmission of God. Forward, forward in the Christian life. Because that's where all your protection is, going forward. You say, yeah, but pastor, I mean, doing the right thing, you get, you get, you get, you get in some battles and some struggles. Well, of course. Why should our Christian life be near the different than the Christians who live on this earth for the last 2,000 years? Why should we be any different? And frankly, if you know your church history at all, you know what we face really isn't that big a deal. I mean, have they, have they drug any of your loved ones through the street, ripped off every square inch of their body? Have they taken your little ones and lined them up in front of you and said, you'll deny your faith? Or they open their body cavities and empty their intestines out in front of you, take your wife and stick her head in a bucket of water and drown her? Tie you to a stake and burn you to death? Has that happened to any of us? The truth is, Bob Jones Sr. used to say, there must be something wrong with the gospel I preach. He said, Paul preached the gospel. He either had revival or ruin, one or the other. He either got revival or he had, everybody got right. Or, I, or he said, or he got persecuted. He said, I preach the gospel and people just say, oh, okay, fine. The, the truth is, our Christian life isn't really that tested. About the worst thing's ever going to happen to you is you're going to lose a couple of so-called friends. And I emphasize the word so-called. I have never lost a true friend to the cause of Jesus Christ. Because you see, your friends should be people who are as serious about the Christian life as you are or more so. I have a principle of friendship. It sounds weird, but stay with me. I refuse to have a friend who's not a compromiser. You say, no, Brother Johnson, it shouldn't be that way. Oh, yeah, it is. All my friends are compromisers. Do you know why? Because all my friends are better Christians than me. It's their fault for being my friend. <laughs> I won't have a friend who's not a better Christian than me. I won't have a friend that doesn't pull me up, not pull me down. I won't have a friend that won't push me forward, not pull me back. See, dear people, this idea of, well, you know, there's just some things. I think I'm just going to back off on the Christian life. You're on your own now. You turned your back on the devil and he will not miss that opportunity. So the armor of God, the whole armor of God, it's, 
It's not complete because God never gave you a piece of protection to walk away. God never gave you a piece of protection for backsliding. God never gave you a piece to protect you when you turn your back on God and walk away from him. No, the thing we must do is just to go forward. We were in bear country a while back. My wife and I took a, a vacation, uh, first one in about five years, as a matter of fact. And we were gone for two and a half weeks, Pastor, two, sun, two Sundays and three Wednesday nights. Got in an RV and drove to Yellowstone, Cody, Wyoming, down through Colorado, into Utah. It was fantastic. We drove 3,500 miles in almost four, 13 days. But it was great. And one of the things they tell you when you go into Yellowstone is you've got to have bear spray. And then, so we bought a can of bear spray. You ever seen that stuff? It's pure cayenne pepper. And it'll spray up to 30 feet. And the instructions, I'm reading the instructions, I just started laughing. When the bear charges you, I thought, what? <laughs> I thought you sprayed it and they just stayed away from you. No, he's got to start coming at you. Oh, I've got to be calm enough when it's 600-pound grizzly bears coming at me to stand there and go, let me see, directions are uh, when, the, when the bear is charging. Is he charging, honey? Okay, uh, the bear is now charging. Pull this pin, point it at the bear, and spray it. If the bear continues to charge, continue to spray. <laughs> and there wasn't anything else after that. I think what you're supposed to do then is you spray the pepper all over you so you'll be, you'll be seasoned while he's eating you because it didn't, it, didn't, it didn't stop you. But what they will tell you is don't run from the bear. You cannot outrun a bear. Now, I have never tried. I don't know. I do know this. You scare me bad enough, I can outrun a bullet. I know that. But they, they say, don't run. you got to stand up to the bear and spray him with this spray. And I thought, okay, that's actually a good analogy of the Christian life too. Only we're not using bear spray, we're using the book. And that book right there, ladies and gentlemen. See, whatever happened to submit yourself, therefore, to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. we got Christians running from the devil and scattering like chickens in a storm. And we're wondering why our Christian life is not effective and powerful enough. Take your stand. That's why we're supposed to have the whole armor of God so we can stand and having done all to stand in the evil day. But you can't do it with it. There's no armor for the back. You can't quit. There's no backing off. God will let you quit, but he'll let you quit on your own. So it's just better to go forward. Look, we're coming to the holiday season. You're probably going to have family come to see you or you're going to go see them. And it should be a blessed time, a wonderful time. But you don't leave your Bible out of the family situation. You don't go over there and start trouble. But on the other hand, I'm not, we're not dipping our sails on what we believe either. Okay. Number four. I only have four points, so you're good luck with number four. Unfortunately, number four has 12 sub points, but stay with me. <laughs> Take unto you the whole armor of God means this. Then that having the armor of God, it's not permanent. You don't take it once and you have it the rest of your life. Well, that's an everyday thing. Day by day by day by every day I start my day, I need to start my day realizing I have to take today, I've got to take the Word of God and put it into practice in my life today. And I've got to make sure I have the Word of God in my heart, in my mind, in my life, in my, in my living, in my, in my home, as I go to, out my life, as I walk out my door, as I go day by day in my life. And when I go to bed tonight, I've got to get up tomorrow and I've got to take unto me the whole armor of God tomorrow. And you do it every Every day of your life. Amen. Well, Pastor Johnson, it's, that sounds so tiresome. Well, what's more tiresome? Having protection so you can stand or having to have to fix the mess that comes when you don't? Yeah. See, sometimes I think we forget, you know, living for God is, there is a price involved in that. You know, Jesus didn't say, if anyone you come after me, take up your recliner. Follow me to the nearest B&B &B and everything will be fine. That's not what he said. Take up your cross and follow me. Okay, he laid out carefully to folks. He said, I don't have anywhere to sleep tonight. You want to go? It's, that, that's the kind of Christian life that should be presented today. Instead of this laid back, sloppy, agape, champagne, sipping, egg, egg scrambling mess they call Christianity nowadays. But the deal is this. Yeah, it'll cost you something to take a stand for God. But it'll cost you something to not take a stand for God. And it will cost you more. 
And it will create. What do we do in the ministry? Much of what we do in the ministry is fix what people should have never broke to begin with. And that's okay. We'll help you. Don't misunderstand me. Well, he doesn't want to help me. I made a mess. No, no. I'll help you. This one lady came to my office one day and she said, Pastor, here's my situation. And she laid out this 30-minute dissertation on the mess of her dear life. And she said, can God help me? I said, I don't think so. She goes, what? I go, just a minute, I'll think of something. I thought, ma'am, how, how could it have gotten that far? She said, well, pastor, I just kept thinking it'll just get better. But it doesn't just get better. We have to get a hold of God, and God's got to get a hold of us, and then God will get. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. There's victory in the Christian life. But unfortunately, victory comes after battles. It comes after struggles. But we stay faithful. God comes through. But I can never assume I have the armor of God. I've got to make sure it's there. Anybody ever been in the military situation, in a battlefield situation there? You do, a, you do an equipment check before you leave. You don't go out to the battlefield and go, now where's my gun? I thought I had a helmet. Did you see my helmet? I didn't have my helmet. You have a full equipment check before you step out of that place. Before you get anywhere near a conflict, you make sure you got every piece of the armor that you need to have for that conflict or you'll become a victim. Christian, you wake up every morning and say, now I've got to get, I'm going to make sure the word of God is in my life and I'm in the word of God today. And, I, and what is it I need to be doing in my life and keep it? You don't just get things right. You get things right. You keep things right. You work at keeping them right. That's just too much involved, Pastor John. So what's the easy step to Christian life? Ain't one. But there's no easy step in the life outside of the will of God. Oh my. The messes that people get themselves in and the situations they create with their life. I've had him come to me and say, one man came to me one day and said, Pastor, I'm not right with God and I'm not happy and I just don't know what I'm going to do, but I don't want to get right. What do I do? I said, partner, I don't have to tell you. You're not happy not doing right, but you don't think you'll be happy if you do right. Well, I know one thing, you ain't happy now. So what partner let's just get this thing straightened out in our life hey let's get this thing in the right gear and get going forward you know the amazing thing about god is he's a patient god and god god understands the fact that he got sinners saved by grace and when we got saved we're still sinners saved by grace that's not licensed to sin that's just the understanding of an almighty god who is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we confess and make it right then he's, he's god's on it he'll help us i know this it ain't easy outside the will of god and it's not easy inside the will of god so i don't have any choice yes you do look here you get in the will of god you have his help you get outside outside the will of god you don't i'll take god's help in a minute we were going to uh, preach, uh, I was going to preach in, down in Visalia for uh, Brother Benefield. And we had loaded up our car, leaving Redding, of course, as you know, is up here about 250 miles north. Stopped in Sacramento to get a bite to eat. Had our stuff in the back of the car, went into a restaurant, buffet please. Went into a restaurant to uh, get a bite to eat. I had suitcases in the back. We had a couple sets of golf clubs in case we had a chance to play. And my briefcase with this Bible, I have had this Bible my soul i've had this bible 30 years probably i've had it rebound so many times i've had it with me i preached all over the world with this bible it's so special to me and i had it in the briefcase in the back of the car also we're sitting down we're just about ready to eat and this lady restaurant manager comes up and she said you driving a silver i think we had the toyota then you driving a silver toyota i said yes ma'am she said somebody just smashed the back window of it and stole the stuff in it i went ah no and we went out there sure enough they had smashed the back window, and the two, we had big suitcases and the golf clubs. They couldn't get that, but they got my briefcase. And in my briefcase was this Bible. And they stole it. And I thought, no. And that grieved me more than anything else. Now, I really didn't have anything else in the briefcase but this and a bunch of sermons that I would taken with me, my notes, calendar, and stuff. But this right here, see this Bible right here? This Bible is very special to me. And I thought they got my Bible. You know what they're going to do. They're going to open that briefcase, see the Bible and stuff, and throw it in the trash, take out whatever they wanted, a tablet, my, my tablet in there, 
take my tablet and my Bible's going to be laying in a trash can somewhere. It just grieved me. We filed a police report and uh, cleaned up the glass and stuff. I called Brother Benefield. I said, I've got my car broke in too. I said, I'm running late. I, I think I'll get there tonight. I said, but uh, j just they stole some of the stuff I had and my Bible's gone. And I said, but I, I'll get there. I mean, I went to the Bible. I took the Gideon Bible out of the Done by sell you took the Gideon Bible out of the drawer, piece of paper, and scratched the outlines down, and I preached from the Gideon Bible that night. And I told the folks, I said they they stole that, and I said, and they got my Bible, this one. Well, the man in the car next to us, they smashed the window, stole his clothes and stuff out of that. He and I were in the police station filling out a report, and we exchanged phone numbers and stuff like that in case the insurance companies wanted to ask if it really happened. We could verify for each other. And I came out of church that night. Honestly, I, I grieved. Because see, this, my Bible, this Bible was in that briefcase and it was gone. And I got out and picked up my phone and this man called me. He said, I have your briefcase. And he goes, and your Bible's in there. Whoever had broken into the car that night, that day, opened it up, saw a Bible, a bunch of sermon outlines and notes, and realized they'd just stolen from a preacher. And they went by a Starbucks and set it in front of the Starbucks with my briefcase. A lady came out, saw the briefcase, found a, I don't remember how she tracked us, but she came out and he, oh yeah, he had business cards and they'd thrown some of his business cards in that briefcase. She called the man, the businessman, had his stuff stolen, said, I've got your briefcase in the Bible and stuff. And he goes, that's not my ass, pastor. He called me and I got my Bible back. The next week, the lady who picked up my briefcase called me and, uh, and said, I have to tell you something. She said, and when I was going through the briefcase to find out who you were, there was a lot of change in there. Whenever I travel somewhere, I don't carry change in my pocket. I throw it in the briefcase. There's like three bucks or three and a half bucks worth of change in there. She goes, and I needed some milk and bread, and I, I took the change. She said, I'm so sorry. I'll send you the $3.75. I go, dear lady. <laughs> You can have that $3.75. I thought, you know, either my Bible or that briefcase has got the power of God on it. I mean, thieves won't steal my Bible. <laughs> the lady was under conviction about stealing $33.75 out of my briefcase. I said, you can have the $3.75. Thank you for getting me. And I got my Bible back. Yeah, but it got taken, but I got it back. Don't you understand, people? When God is on your side, you have the armor of God. The whole armor of God. Then you can stand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, you can defend yourself against the fiery darts of the wicked. You have God's help, God's assistance, God's strength, God's guidance. God's, you have what you need. But you have to have the whole armor of God. Stand to your feet, please, tonight, would you?